Sports Radio, WKNR. All sports, all the time. Can't get to the game? Yes, you can. Can't get to the game? Yes, you can. Sports Radio, WKNR has sports action, talk, and games wherever you go. Can't get a ticket? We have your seat. Sports action, talk. Games. On WKNR, wherever you go, wherever you are. Sports Radio, WKNR, all sports, all the time. Damn. Touch him all time for Manny Ramirez. Damn. Long throw for Vizcarra. Got it. Damn. Damn. When the tribe's on the tube, turn to two guys that know the game. Guys that know the players. Damn. Guys that deliver the heat. Jack and Mike and the Indians. Two winning teams, one tribe. Jam. Only on Channel 43, Cleveland's home team. Jam. So the Cleveland Indians are the American League champs, and in our quest to bring you closer to the story, and of course keeping with the tradition of catcher cam, Fox Sports News proudly presents Trophy Cam. <laughs> Doesn't anyone just high-five anymore? Dating back to spring training, the Florida Marlins and the Cleveland Indians have, between them, played more than 400 baseball games this season. And now, it's reduced to one game. One game in which any single play, any single pitch, might decide the 1997 World Champion. Game 7 of the 1997 World Series. For the Cleveland Indians, it would mark their second appearance in the Fall Classic in three years. But how did the Indians manage to make it the most exciting event in recent sports history? After taking baseball's best record to the 96 Division Series and being bounced early by the Orioles... That one is hit deep into center field. Lofton is going back. Still going back. All the way back. Gone! Home run! 4-3 to three Baltimore and suffering an off-season loss that rocked the city. No, it wasn't about the, the most money. I mean, um, you know, I'm sure I could have um, shopped around and, um, you know, got more money, but... And a last-minute trade that raised eyebrows and emotions. We were not going to be able to sign him. We don't have a crystal ball in this business. Um, but we just felt with where we had gone with the contract that we were not going to be able to retain him. How indeed did the Indians make it back to the World Series for the second time in three years? When the Cleveland Indians opened spring training camp in Winter Haven, Florida, everyone, the fans and media alike, all want to know, what are the Indians going to do to bring another championship team to Cleveland? General Manager John Hart and his staff had already developed a plan. We always felt that a good club that is good enough to win its division has a chance in postseason. To that end, the Tribe acquires veteran Gold Club third baseman Matt Williams, reliever Mike Jackson, infielder Tony Fernandez, and backup catcher Pat Borders. Jim Tomey, who had been the only Tribe third baseman since the Jacobs Field era began, was moved to first. Throw into that mix the last-minute deal that brings outfielders David Justice and Marquise Grissom to the Indians from Atlanta, and all of a sudden there's a whole lot of changes and lots of new faces. When the team starts the season, there are only three starting players returning to their 1996 positions. Yeah, I think uh, our teammates and uh, the coaches, they welcome us with open arms, and, you know, we pretty much felt accepted from day one. I did. And, um, 
but you want to come over, you want to do well, you want to fit in, you want to um, let your teammates know that you're out, you know, to win. And that's all I've wanted to do since day one, come over here and fit in, you know, and um, come to the park and have fun every day and go out there and win. I really didn't know who, on, who was on the team. I mean, the day I was traded, I had no idea who was on the Cleveland Indians ball club. I remembered a couple guys that they had from the World Series, but other than that, I couldn't have told you the guys on their team. Um, so uh, once I got over here and um, you know I looked around and saw the players, I said, well, at least I feel like we're gonna have a good team, a competitive team. I uh, traded uh, Matt Williams for uh, Jeff Ken and Vizcaino and Julian Tavares. And uh, I felt that was a good trade for us because uh, moving Jim Tomey to the first base and bringing a gold glove to third base, that really solid, solidify our infield. And you have Omar Vizcal in short, Matt Williams at third, and you have uh, Tony Fernandez uh, and then later on Big Roberts. But uh, that really uh, solidify our infield. And uh, I think that um, everybody looked at Matt Williams as a home run hitter and power hitter. He does produce some home runs, and by his defense, he's unbelievable. This guy has made unbelievable plays for us. Well, you know, it was obvious. I mean, we were getting an all-star in Matt Williams, and uh, you know, at the time, it was a, it was a, kind of a, a weird feeling that went through my mind in the fact that you know I've always played third base, and uh, you know I looked at it, and, and when you can get an all-star for an all-star, I mean, it was it was irrelevant, and we got Matt Williams, and it ended up working out. You know, I gained a great friend in return. Indians fans, proud of their record for consecutive sellouts and anxious for another run at winning the Central Division, again respond to the successes of the Jacobs Field era with an unprecedented second straight sellout season. Little did they know what a huge role they would play six months later. As the 1997 championship season gets started, newcomers David Justice and Matt Williams contribute right away. Pitch to Justice, he rips it down the right field line, and it is gone into the Milwaukee bullpen. Oh, another home run. As David Justice really puts the lid on this one. Fly ball, well hit left field, gap back goes Albert Bell to the warning track. At the wall, leaps and he cannot get it. Justice at second base with a double. Rally alive, and he does. Way back. Oh, this ball is gone. David Justice off the facing of the mezzanine. A three-run homer, and we are tied at 4-4. The pitch. A swing and a high drive to deep left. If it's fair, get out of here. Gone. He hit the back. Gate on the home run porch. Matt Williams with a tape measure job. The Indians on top, five to four. The pitch, and it's swung on, hit sharply to third. Diving toward the bank, Williams grabs, scrambles to his feet, and throws out Williams. He lines that ball hard in left field. Back is Giambi, it's over his head, and it is gone. A line drive home run by Matt Williams, a three-run dinger at 7-4 Indians. He got a charge in that, baby. The 0-1 pitch, swung on and a high drive to deep left field. That goes Giambi at the wall, looking up. It is gone to the home run porch. Matt Williams with one of his biggest hits as an Indian. Not only do the bats get going early, but veteran starting pitcher Charles Nagy gets off to a great start as well. Swing and a miss, and Charlie Nagy records strikeout number five. Sunshine. Swing and a miss, he got him with a chain. The one-two pitch, strike three call. Nagy came underneath. Ground ball back to the mound, nice play by Charlie Nagy, throws him out. Nagy delivers. Swing and a miss, strike three. Now the one-two offering. Swung on and missed. He strikes him out with a good splitter. The Tribe heads into the second month of the season, just one game out of first. Manny Ramirez is on his way to hitting a career-best 328, and time after time delivers in the clutch. And the pitch. 
Long drive, left field. Back goes Damon. That ball is gone. A home run. The Indians on top, four to three. Beck gets a line drive to right field. Manny Ramirez coming toward the line, dives. And did he catch it? Yes, he did. A nice play by Manny Ramirez. Well, Manny has done a job defensively tonight. But here in the bottom of the third inning. Ramirez drive deep left field. This ball is up and this ball is gone. It's a grand slam home run. The Indians go up four to nothing. On an 0-2 pitch. Manny is a, a great player. And uh, he goes, uh, he gets his work in, and uh, he's just an awesome hitter. You know, I keep telling him that day in and day out, and I, and I, and I want to tell him that because I watched a lot of guys play during the course of my career, and um, per hitters, he's got to be right up there at the top as far as one of the best per hitters in baseball. There goes the runner. A line drive, center field. Chasing back, still going back is Hunter. That ball is gone. It landed in the Indian bullpen. Boy, did Manny put a charge in it. Hard throwing right handed reliever Mike Jackson steps up to play the role of closer and earns four saves in May with a 154 ERA. 3 2 pitch. Swing, struck him out. The game is over. He blew the fastball right by him. Another fine job by Mike Jackson as he strikes out the last two and the Indians win it one to nothing. third strike and the Indians have defeated the Seattle Mariners in game one of this three game series. The Indians also take a little time early in the season to reaffirm their commitment to stability as they announce long term contracts for David Justice, Marquise Grissom and Jim Tomey. The faces may change but the Indian strategy for long term success remains the same. Uh, these players are winners. They're in the prime of their careers and they're going to be a part of what we think is the continuing vision in Cleveland, which is championship baseball. The excitement that this city has for this ball club is unbelievable. I mean, I thought there was some excitement in Atlanta, but it's, it's so much better here. Tribe fans get their first look at interleague play in the month of June. They also get to see a lot of rain. But not even Mother Nature can cool the red-hot bat of the American League's leading hitter, Sandy Alomar. Sandy got a hit in every game in the month of June for an average of 420 on his way to a career season. A long drive left field, chasing back his Duncan at the wall. It's gone, a home run. Sandy Alomar, a three-run home run. The set, the pitch. Alomar lines one to deep left. Cordova going back. It's going to be at the base of the wall. That'll score Seitzer. Here comes Tommy. He will score. Alomar rocks a two-run double. There goes the runner. Pitch is low and outside. Throw to third. Slide. He is out. Jose Canseco trying to steal third, and Sandy Alomar nailed him. Hit well into the gap in right center field. It'll be extra bases. Manny Ramirez going to be waved around. Here comes Ramirez, the throw coming home. Not in time, and it gets by the catcher. Alomar will go to third. A double for Alomar. Alomar drills one to deep left field. Away back and gone to the home run porch. Now, how about that? As far as extending a hitting streak and taking the suspense out of it in a hurry. A 24 game hitting streak for Alomar, the longest ever in Indians history for a catcher. And it's a two to one ball game, twins on top. Alomar with 12 homers, one more than he had all of last year, and now two shy of a career best. With the Indians leading the Central Division by three and a half games, Sandy takes his 30 game hitting streak to the All-Star game. Jim Tomey is also named to the American League squad to replace the injured David Justice. The 68th Midsummer Classic is the fifth time the Indians in the city of Cleveland host the All-Star Game. And the week-long festivities begin with a tribute to a man who not only made, but changed history. I want to thank all of those in attendance this evening. I want to thank the Cleveland Indians for their hospitality. And more than that, I want to go back a decade, Larry, and I want to thank them for the way that they treated you and the things that they stood for. Because without them, 
I don't think any of us would have made it. I want to thank you personally, myself, for all of the things that you went through, because if it had not been for you, I would not have had the career that I had. I certainly want to thank you for all of the things that you've done. Baseball is the reason why I'm standing before you today. And I can say this with all sincerity. Your great fans, your great fans were in hours here, and your great fans now. They can talk about the other cities. This is it. Thank you very much. The Indians and Major League Baseball donate the proceeds of nearly $1 million from the All-Star Workout Day to build a series of Larry Doby All-Star Playgrounds throughout the city of Cleveland as a lasting tribute to honor the legacy of Larry Doby and the All-Star Game in Cleveland. All-Star Week also brings us a whole convention center full of fun at the Pinnacle All-Star Fan Fest. The workout day on Monday starts with some silly fun at the Celebrity Softball Game and ends with some serious bombs in the Home Run Derby. Even with all of the fun and excitement leading up to the game, no one will ever forget the magic of the 68th Midsummer Classic. And a little tip of the cap, and now here we go. <laughs> it's Larry Walker. <laughs> I told you it hit right-handed. We were talking about it before the game. He batted right-handed earlier in the year in batting practice. And here he is, he's going to face him right in and why not? A lot of people don't remember that these two are former teammates coming up through the Expos organizations. And Maddox hooking up and Martinez gets into on the left. At the track, at the wall, goodbye. Two balls, two strikes and that's hit well. Is it fair? It's fair, it's gone and we're tied. It is fair. And it's a 1-1 game in the seventh. Center field, hometown hero, goodbye. That was a moment in time since I've been in the big leagues that I really truly had fun. And it was very relaxing to a point that there was no pressure to perform. You know, the home run contest, I didn't hit a home run, but just being in it, just being in it, and uh, just having a great time was the most important thing. And that's something I always, always cherish, the fact that my first All-Star game was in Cleveland, in my hometown. You always tell yourself, if you can't do it, you wish it upon one of your teammates. And San I'll tell you what, Sandy, it was truly unbelievable to the fact that when he got that home run, it was just like a dream come true. And that's been the type of season he's had all year. I mean, he's gotten big hits when we needed it. And, uh, you know, to me, he's our MVP of the team. I was hoping to make the All-Star game here at Jacob Field. Uh, I had a great start, and the first half was outstanding, so I knew I had a chance to make the All-Star game. It was up to Joe Torres to pick me as a reserve uh, catcher because Pacho Rodriguez is a heck of a catcher, and, and you know the fans are going to vote for him. So just getting in the game and getting a chance to hit with a game on the line once again and delivering like that in front of your hometown fan, that was probably the most gratifying thing you can ever have. And uh, I just thank God to give me the opportunity to be there in that situation and coming through, it was unbelievable. 
As the summer heated up, so do the Indians. Tony Fernandez leads the team in July with a 375 average and 15 RBIs. 2-2 pitch. Brown ball first base side, goes through a base hit, and that'll get a run home. And so the pass ball is very costly to the Texas Rangers. Swung on and lined to deep right down the line. Going back as Ordonez looking up and scored! Just inside the foul pole. How about that? Offering. Swung on, a smash to third right by Coomer into left. Put the glove down, but not in time. That's got to be a hit for Tony Fernandez. On the other side of second, on his way to another gold glove season, shortstop Omar Vizquel gets hot with the bat and burns up the base pass. A swing and a line shot to right field. It's a base hit. Borders will score. Grissom will stop at third. Six to three drive. Fly ball up in the air to center field. Going out in the shortstop. He can't get to it. Drops the base hit. Vizquel is going to go to second. The next delivery swung on a smash up the middle. Off the glove of Clark. Behind second, Vizquel. Bear hand grab and throw for the out. Oh, what a play by Vizquel. There goes the runner, pitches low outside. Throw to second base, slide, and save at second base. Since the Jacobs Field era began, Omar has been used to looking over his left shoulder and seeing another gold glover. And four-time winner Marquise Grissom proved that center field was in good hands. Field deep around toward right, the set, the pitch, and it swung on and belted to deep right center. Back goes Grissom at the wall, jumps up, and this ball is caught! An amazing catch again by Grissom! Center field, back is Grissom to the warning track. Leaps and makes the catch. The inning is over. Swung on and built it to deep center. Grissom racing back. Grissom has the ball, and he makes a terrific catch. With his back to the infield, just in front of the dry bullpen. He delivers. Grissom hits a shot on the ground by it, diving Russ Davis at third down the left field line. Grissom digging for two. Jose Cruz with the throw to second, head first slide, safe. A double for Grissom. The, the American League is a little different from the National League. You know, I'm an aggressive okay, hitter. And over here, I think you have to be a little bit more patient because of all the off-speed pitches, the breaking balls, change-ups, and kind of had to change my game plan around. But it took me a whole season to do that. But um, other than that, everything else went smooth. July also gives Indians fans a taste of the not-so-distant future with their first glimpse of 21-year-old rookie Jared Wright. Runners at the corners, two-strike pitch, swung on and missed. And the delivery. Swing and a miss, strike three. For the second time, made sure the strike out victim that 2 2 delivery. Swung on and missed as Wright strikes out Fabregas. Swing and a miss, strike three. Jared Wright gets strike out number five. The tribe finishes the month of August strong, losing only seven of 19 and tie a club record for home runs in a month with 50. David Justice leads the offense. Williams has his best month, and first baseman Jim Tomey cranks it up. A swing and a towering drive to deep center. Brumfield racing back at the wall. It is door to the picnic plaza. The next delivery. Swung on, driven deep to right field. Back goes Lawton. It's at the wall. And Jim Tomey has number 21. High and deep to center field. Back is Williams to the warning track to the wall. It's in the bullpen, one nothing, India. Long drive, left field, that's well hit. Bank goes the left field, he'll just watch it sail into the bleachers. A home run for Jim Tomey. There's a high pop on the first base side. Foul territory. Over near the dugout is Tommy. He grabs the ball, falls in the dugout. I think he held on to the ball. He did. Umpire was right there. And it's not just Tommy's bat providing the magic. It starts when the team honors Jim on his birthday by wearing their socks up and ripping the Angels 10 to 4. Jimmy says it's all David Justice's idea. Well, the, the week before my birthday, David Justice kept joking around. He kept saying, hey, it's Tony's birthday in a week. Let's do something for him to, to kind of celebrate his birthday. So that day we came to the park, I actually had an off day. I think there was a left-hander throwing, and I had an off day. 
and they did it. They all pulled them up, and uh, I think we scored like 12 runs, 14 runs that game, whatever it was. And uh, ever since then, I think it really, it, it kind of brought us together to the fact that, you know, it was a little thing, and then little things might get overlooked, but in the long run where we're at right now, I think it was very important at that time. As a dedication that Jim told me on his birthday, that's what we decided to do. Everybody was going to surprise him because he wasn't playing. We was going to wear our socks up high. And everybody did, and it kind of brought the team together a little bit. We fell behind two or three runs in that game, and uh, we just started talking about the Sox. And everybody just, you know, got fired up, and we came back and won that game, 9-7 or something like that. And we just we went off and won five or six games straight, and, and uh, we just kept the Sox up. And I think that little cliche brought us closer together as a team and as a unit for us to go out and uh, get to the playoff. It was a big step for us. I don't, I don't think that one thing unified our team. Um, <clears throat> I, but I, I don't think it hurt our ball club. I think it, it, it definitely made us um, come together maybe a little bit more, but I wouldn't say that one thing naturally, I mean, just brought us all together and all of a sudden now we're a team. I, don't, I think it happened probably earlier than that. I came back, I, it was in Pittsburgh, and they were like, hey man, you got to roll your socks up. I'm like, go out, I'll roll them up. So I rolled them up, and um, when I rolled them up, I won the game, so I was like, okay, I gotta wear them the rest of you know rest of the year that way. I didn't care about Jim Tomey or anybody else anymore, man. I won. Maybe it's the Sox, maybe not. But in any event, good things start happening for the tribe. Oral Hershiser comes off the DL and goes three and zero in four starts. Payoff pitch, a little number hit back to the mound, backhanded nicely by Hershiser. He fires to first for the out. Playoffs twice with the Cubs. The pitch to him and he swings and misses at a breaking ball that was low and away. And the pitch to Bell swung on and missed. He gets him swinging and the pitch swing and a miss. He got him with a slider. The one-two offering, strike three called. Fastball over the inside corner, and Hershiser strong through two. The set and pitch, a swing and a miss as Hershiser records his fifth strikeout. The bullpen starts to put it together consistently. Paul Asimacher gets two wins and no losses and posts an ERA of .73. What a job by Paul Asimacher. There goes the runner. Strike three call right down at the knees. Asimacher ready. And strike three over the inside corner. He got Burnett's without Burnett's ever swinging the bat. The next offering, Cruz a swing and a miss. And the pitch. Swing and a miss, strike three. Another sight for sore eyes is the return of the real Jose Mesa as the tribe closer. Logging two wins, six saves, and an ERA of .56. Taking the run a short lead. Ground ball could be two. Up with the Vizquel over the second one. Back to the first, a double play. And this game is over. And the delivery. Swing and a miss, strike three. Mesa delivers. Swing and a miss, strike three. The game is over. The Indians have swept the Chicago White Sox. As summer starts to turn towards fall, the Indians acquire Bip Roberts, and the versatile veteran is thrilled to be joining a contender. Well, my first thoughts was, you know, I'm going to a team that's uh, in the pennant race. Uh, you know, prior to that, uh, it was just a situation where we were playing a string out in Kansas City, uh, trying to get home, it's tired, achy. But uh, when I got that call, it was like a, a shot in the arm. Um, Instantly, I felt energy. Instantly, I felt as though I could help contribute. And I also felt a little nervous, you know. I hadn't played second base all season, and it was my first opportunity to play second, and it's in the, it's in the thick of it. And uh, I didn't want to come over here and, and blow it. And Bip makes an immediate impact in his first at bat as a member of the tribe. Swung on and belted to deep right field, away back, go on! Roberts in his Indians debut at Jacobs Field puts a charge into one, landing in the lower deck in right. His second home run of the season, and the Indians on top, one to nothing. In September, we also take time out to recognize and thank a man whose name and voice have been synonymous with Indians baseball for over a third of a century. You know, somebody once said that uh, timing is everything. You're in the right place at the right time. And I think my entire life, I have been in the right place at the right time. And youngster, I went to school, and Father Kelly taught me how to pitch. I got into professional baseball. We had, I think, two of the greatest uh, 
people to work with pitches. Mel Harder and Al Lopez here in Cleveland. Then I got into broadcasting. I was fortunate enough to uh, have some great partners. And Joe Tate to uh, Tom Hamilton, uh, they've all been outstanding. And I think that uh, the thanks should go the other way around. I should thank them. I have been very fortunate. I'm going to end this right now. I'd like to thank all you people for all the kindnesses you've given me over the years. It's been a, it's been a great ride. And uh, I think I still most of my faculties. I'm pretty good, pretty good health. And I hope to enjoy it for some years to come. I, uh, I missed a lot. Uh, weddings and uh, births and graduation in college, so we'll make it up with our grandchildren, which we have eight. But I hope you're as kind to the fellow coming along as you've been to me. And I'd like to thank the Cleveland Indians. They have uh, given me a life. And when Mr. Jacobs bought the ball club, we solidified everything in, in this beautiful ballpark. And uh, it is a nice ballpark in baseball. And it's been said before, and I must say it again, none of us who are fortunate enough to play baseball, whether it be Babe Ruth or Willie Mays or Lou Gehrig or the modern-day ball players or Cal Ripken. Nobody ever puts into the game what they take out of it. We take a life out of it. And our life is directly responsible for you people. We thank you very much. Good night. The Indians have struggled all season to gain an identity, to establish a personality. Now, all of the faces, new and old, are playing like a team as the season comes to a close. On September 23rd, the Tribe clinches their third straight American League Central Division Championship, becoming, along with the Braves, the only teams to win three straight division titles since the new format began. And they do it in dramatic fashion against the New York Yankees. Line right center field, it's a base hit, the game is over. The Indians have won it. Boy, they come charging into that dugout. Sandy Alamo getting his fourth RBI of the game, his 79th of the year, and the Tribe comes back from a 9-2 deficit as they win it 10-9. As the regular season ends, the Indians have spent 116 days in first place, every day but one since May 17th through the end of the season. They are the first team in the American League to hit 200 or more home runs in three consecutive seasons as they launch a club record of 220. They hit 50 home runs in August alone. Jacobs Field hosted a record-breaking 3,404,750 fans. And those fans hold a major league record of 211 consecutive sellouts. And it's no wonder fans flock to the ballpark. During the Jacobs Field era, Cleveland baseball fans have enjoyed the best record in the American League. 351 wins against only 228 losses three straight American League Central titles, and two American League pennants, a stark contrast to the first 94 years of the franchise's existence that it took to make the postseason three times. Every year we build a club that we feel is going to win this division. Uh, many times uh, in, in my business, uh, people criticize us for that, that uh, during the winter you should build a club that is going to be a World Series uh, championship caliber club. Uh, we feel that it is of greater importance to build a club that is going to win its division than build a club in the winter that is a World Series championship club. Too many things go wrong. Uh, expectations become incredible. Um, we look at, at the first step to winning a World Series is winning your division. And uh, we've talked about this here over the last three years. It's been tough. I think convincing people that that is the best way to go because we've gone gate to gate really over the last couple of three years. Um, so I think our philosophy of building a divisional champion, a club that is going to be able to play well through 162 games that may not on paper appear to be the strongest club, many times has a chance to be a club that will perform better in a postseason. We have the ability, if we do it that way, to make moves during the season that might help us. Uh, if we find we have an injury or weaknesses in one area that uh, we'll have that ability to do that during the season. So uh, our philosophy of building a club for the divisional championship certainly I think paid off this year.
Indians fans used to being part of exciting baseball had no idea what was in store for them in the 1997 postseason. It began with the division series against longtime nemesis, the New York Yankees. The defending world champions had won the season series over the Tribe six games to five. And in game one, it looked like the good guys were going to pour it on the Yanks, scoring five times in the top of the first, capped off by Sandy Alomar. Into left field, sends Curtis back at the track, at the wall, and it's gone. A three-run home run for Sandy Alomar Jr. And this is indeed a big first inning for the Indians. They lead by five. The Yankees whittled away at the Cleveland lead, and in the sixth, trailing six to three, Wade Boggs singled, then scored on a Ray Sanchez liner. Up next, Tim Raines. One on, two out, Raines hits it to right. What time? Then Derek Jeter. Jeter into left field. Giles back at the wall. Yankees lead. Next, Paul O'Neill. Now the 0-2 to O'Neill is smoked to center. Grissom back. The back-to-back-to-back -back -to -back home runs proved to be too much for the Tribe as game one of the divisional series belonged to the Bronx Bombers, 8-6. Taking the mound in game two was rookie sensation Jared Wright. And before 57,000 screaming fans at Yankee Stadium, the youngster kept his poise despite giving up three early runs as the Tribes batsmen rallied behind the rookie. The score was tied at three apiece. Then up stepped Tony Fernandez. Well hit to left field. Curtis stumbling over his head. Up against the wall. Alomar scores. Here comes Toby. The relay is too late. The throw gets away not far enough, and it's 5-3 Indians in the fourth. Matt Williams came to bat and closed out the scoring for the Tribe with this monster shot to left. At the track, at the wall, gone. A two-run home run and a 7-3 Cleveland lead. The series was knotted up at one apiece, and the series was now shifting to Jacobs Field. Game three could be described in two words, David Wells. The Yankee left-hander dominated the Indians through nine innings of five-hit baseball. Suddenly, the Tribe found themselves trailing two games to one in a best-of-five series. They needed a lift. They needed a spark. They needed the magic to return to Jacobs Field. With their backs firmly against the wall, the Tribe knew there was no tomorrow without a win today. Once again, Tribe pitching struggled, spotting the Yankees two runs in the first inning. It could have been much worse had it not been for some outstanding defense turned in by Brian Giles and Sandy Alomar. They'll bring home Martinez, the throw from Giles. In time, and out at the plate to end the top of the first inning. Then the man who put the tag on O'Neill put a tag on the baseball that tied the score at two. The drive well hit the right field. Back goes O'Neill at the wall. He leaps, and it's gone. We have a tie game. We move to the bottom of the ninth with a score tied, and suddenly there was magic in the air. Little flare off the bat of Grissom, falling in a hurry. Case hit. Next up, Bip Roberts, who had one thing on his mind. Move Grissom to second. Sanchez, a heck of a play to complete. The sacrifice for three. Next up, Omar Vizquel. With two hits to his credit already in the ball game, the Indian shortstop ripped perhaps the biggest hit of his career. Base hit. There will be game five tomorrow night. The Magic was indeed back at Jacobs Field, and the team now realized they had a huge advantage heading into game five. Their 10th man, the fans at Jacobs Field. The Tribe put their playoff hopes in the hands of young Jared Wright for Game 5, and oh, how the rookie responded. Providing a helping hand along the way was the Tribe's defense. Off the glove of Wright, and the only play the Tribe, and they get the double play. After holding the Yankees scoreless through three innings, the Cleveland Bats came alive in the bottom of the frame. Williams back over his head, and the Indians take a 2 nothing lead. Ramirez makes it 
Irving Cleveland. In the ninth, with Jacobs Field rocking, Jose Mesa recorded two quick outs on grounders to Fernandez and Williams. O'Neill then doubled off Mesa, which brought Bernie Williams to the plate. And the left center field. Giles is there. Celebrate. Up next, a showdown between the Tribe and the winningest team in baseball in 97, the Baltimore Orioles. Game one at Camden Yards started out looking like a Brady Anderson highlight video. First showing off his glove in the top of the first. Track, wall, leaps, got it. Then his bat in the bottom of the frame. Anderson gets the chance to lead off, goes deep to right. It's been a good five minutes for Brady Anderson. One nothing Baltimore. It was all the offense the O's would need. Before you knew it, the Tribe was down in the ALCS, one game to none. Although the Tribe found themselves 350 miles from home, somehow a little bit of that Jacobs Field magic had followed them to Baltimore. Trailing 4-2 in the eighth, it was time for a little Tribe magic. And a left center field, deep left center field. Trap, wall, gone, a three-run home run for Marquise Grissom and a 5-4 Indian lead in the eighth. Game two was history, and the Tribe was coming home with a series tied at one win apiece. Game three, and Baltimore's Mike Mussina and Cleveland's Oral Hershiser battled through six scoreless innings. Mussina was untouchable, striking out 15 and walking just two batters. Hershiser was just as effective, allowing just four hits and striking out seven. However, in the bottom of the seventh, the Tribe broke through, thanks to a walk by Tony, a booted play in center by Anderson, and this clutch at bat by Matt Williams. To the shortstop, pass board it into center. Here comes Tony, and the Indians take a seventh inning lead. That looked like the ball game, but in the top of the ninth, things turned downright bizarre. He doesn't see it. Back behind his head, and played by Giles in to score is Revelle, and Grissom never saw it. With a score tied at one, we moved into the 12th. Following a Grissom walk, Tony Fernandez dug in. The third, the throw by Hammonds is too late. With Grissom now on third and Omar Vizquel at the plate, everyone was thinking suicide squeeze. What they got was, well, bizarre. Here comes Grissom, and safe at the plate, Indians win, Vizquel missed it. The Tribe was up two games to one as we moved on to game four. Going into the ninth inning, the Tribe was clinging to a seven to six lead. That soon would vanish on a Palmero infield hit that scored Robbie Alomar to the bottom of the ninth. And with Manny Ramirez on second, Sandy Alomar stepped up to the plate. In the left center field, Indians win. Alomar's heroics gave the Tribe a 3-1 to one series edge and those who were skeptical about the Tribe and their Jacobs Field magic were becoming believers. Facing elimination, Baltimore got outstanding pitching from Scott Kamenicki and Jimmy Key. The twosome combined for eight shutout innings as the Birds scored all they needed in the third, plating two runners on a base hit to center by Geronimo Baroja. And hit and passed Vizquel into left center. 49,075 crammed into Camden Yards to witness what was to become one of the most entertaining games in ALCS history. Let's talk about fate. Prior to the start of game six, the Tribe was taking batting practice. Tony Fernandez was in the cage getting loose and hit a ball that bruised the left thumb of scheduled second base starter Bip Roberts. Scratch Roberts from the lineup and insert Fernandez. With two outs in the top of the 11th, Tony Fernandez made the lineup change, one that every Cleveland Indians fan will remember for a long, long time. In the air to right, track, wall, gone. And the Indians take a 1-0 11th inning lead. The Cleveland Indians were the 1997 American League champions. Next, a trip to the Sunshine State to face the Florida Marlins in the 1997 World Series. 
and the magical season continued. Game one pitching matchups featured the Tribe's 39-year-old veteran Oral Hershiser and Florida's 22-year-old Levon Hernandez. The Tribe scored first on a leadoff double by Bip Roberts, a sacrifice bunt by Omar Vizquel, and an RBI single to center by David Justice. Not nearly in time to get the speedy Roberts. A line and a center. It drops for a hit. And the Indians grab the lead. 1-0 Cleveland on the Justice single. Florida tied things up in the third and blew things up in the fourth, scoring four times capped off by back-to-back -back home runs by Moises Alou and Charles Johnson. And now this ball is bolted. Back to back and into the upper deck. Trailing in the series and facing Florida pitching ace Kevin Brown, the Tribe got to work right away. Jumping out front on a Vizquel double and an RBI single by David Justice. This ball is lined to right and they're on the board first. Justice comes through in the first inning again. In the bottom of the first, Chad O.J. would yield the Marlins' only run as the young righty would find his control and dominate the Marlins for six-plus innings. And in the sixth, the Tribe put the game away thanks to Sandy Alomar. Here's a rocket to left, and this one's not coming back. On a day that was better suited for football, the Indians and Marlins took to the field and put up football-type numbers. Final score, Florida 14, Cleveland 11. A field goal would have tied it. Leading by seven going into the bottom of the ninth, the Tribe put the scare of a lifetime into manager Jim Leland and the rest of the Marlins, closing the gap to three runs before the Marlins took game three. Despite a first pitch temperature of a record low 38 degrees, the Tribe hitters came out red hot. A liner for a hit toward the gap. If it gets through, a run might score. On his way to third is Williams. Newman's waving him home. Could be close on Renneria's throw. Set. The Tribe led six to nothing after three, but the Marlins battled back, cutting the lead in half on a two-run homer by Moises Alou. And watches it leave. In the bottom of the eighth, Matt Williams put an exclamation point on the Cleveland hitting attack by sending this rocket into the night. Matt Williams putting the finishing touches on a perfect night. Two singles, a homer, and a pair of walks. A three-game series would now decide who was world champions. The Marlins scored twice in the second to start game five. It could have been worse had it not been for this defensive gem turned in by the truck. Now the pick home and they get him in time. The Indians took the lead in the third. After walks to Williams and Tomey, Marlins starter Levon Hernandez knew he had to throw a strike, and he did. Right down Main Street, and Sandy Alomar took it for a ride. The Tribe led 4-2 going into the sixth inning. They trailed 6-4 midway through the sixth, as once again the walk and the long ball hurt the Tribe. Time in this World Series. Game six featured a rematch of game two starters, Kevin Brown for the Marlins and Chad O.J. for the Indians. Scoreless after one, the Indians came to bat and an unlikely hero provided the scoring punch. How about that? One run home. Second man being waved in. Johnson leaps to the peg, and by the time he comes down, the Indians are in front two to nothing. The two-run single by O.J. would be all the offense the Tribe would need. In the fifth, Chad returned to the plate to prove to the Marlins and his own teammates that his hitting was no fluke. Not in time. In the sixth, with Marlins on second and third and Mike Jackson on in relief of Chad O.J., Omar Vizquel turned back the Marlins on a spectacular play. What a play! The bullpen once again shut the door, and the Tribe and Marlins were headed to Game 7. Game 7 of the World Series, and taking the mound for the Indians was Jared Wright, and the rookie responded brilliantly. Breaking ball got him. First strikeout for Wright. The Tribe scored twice in the third off Florida starter Al Leiter. With runners on second and third, up stepped Tony Fernandez. And 
Fernandez with a liner in the center for a base hit. Tommy scores. Grissom is right behind him. It's 2-0 Cleveland. The Tribe carried their lead into the seventh when Bobby Bonilla cut the lead in half. Craig Council's sacrifice fly tied the game at two, and game seven of the 1997 World Series was heading into extra innings. Series is tied. In the 11th, Charlie Nagy would come on in relief of Mesa and give up a leadoff single to Bobby Bonilla. A ground ball through the right side moved Bonilla to third. An intentional walk loaded the bases, bringing Edgar Renteria to the plate. The 0-1 pitch. A liner off Nagy's glove into center field. The Florida Marlins have won the World Series. This ball club won a lot of games because because of the character and heart that this team ha has. I mean, these guys care very deeply about each other and about playing the game the way it is. And that's, that's, I've seen a lot of winners on losing ball clubs, and I've seen a lot of winners, uh, losers on winning ball clubs. There are a lot of winners on this ball club just for the simple reason that these guys don't know when it's time to check it in and quit. The Jacobs Field era of Cleveland Indians baseball has defined the renaissance of this franchise and the city of Cleveland. It is a renaissance that transcends the professional sports world. It resonates the exciting rebirth of the city in which we play. It is a success story that has made, by all accounts, the Cleveland Indians one of the model franchises in all of sports. This is all possible in large part due to the energy and enthusiasm of Tribe fans everywhere, the best fans in America.